Thank you, everyone. We're looking at uh, moving forward a few centuries and looking at another famous uh, poetic treatise or treatise on poetics from the ancient period. This one's by a writer who is known as Longinus, sometimes called Pseudo Longinus because they don't know who the author was per se. And it's uh, title was given to be On the Sublime in, in Greek. It's Perihupsus. On the Elevated. And uh, interestingly, I, I th this is the case on the course. It's challenging to know what materials to put on the course because partly because the length of the time, I mean, it's thousands of years that I'm covering, and I'm leaving a great deal out of, of necessity. And some things are on there because they are important and they remain important and they were influential in their time and they remain influential. Sometimes they were influential in their day and they cease to be influential with later developments. And in this case, as far as I know, when Longinus wrote this, it was not particularly influential. But it, there is no more influential work come the early modern period on aesthetics <coughs> and poetics than this little treatise. And that has its own uh, history, and it's, uh, to me, kind of fascinating um, as a Christian, because it, it, the reason that the sublime took such importance in the late 17th century is because uh, a, rem a member of the French Academy, the Academy Francaise, uh, Nicolas Boileau, associated the sublime with a category of uh, writing that was uh, above all others, and he connected it particularly with Christian theology. And um, so I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit because we're going to come later on the course to a discussion of the sublime in the 18th century. It's the aesthetic category, the sublime versus the beautiful. Uh, so we'll spend over a month talking about different uh, variations on that from Edmund Burke to Kant. The, the Romantics also have something to say about the subject. Uh, but it's largely because it takes on a different significance in that period as opposed to what it was in Longinus' day. And, uh, and Boileau's take on it in connection of the sublime with a theological category of speech which it transcends other categorization is influential uh, on, I would say, the higher criticism as well. So, but I'll, I'll come to that when we come to it. So it, it, it's a way of distinguishing this, uh, uh, that is the Bible, as a work of uh, literature, really that it, it expresses sublimity, and we'll, we'll look at some of the features of that when we come to it. But that's just to say that this treatise in its day was not particularly influential, but 1,500 years ago, it was all important, which is odd. Um, but that happens. There are times that texts uh, in their day are wildly popular, and then within 10 years, nobody ever talks about them anymore. And then there are others, and Shakespeare is an example even. He was very popular in his day, famed. In fact, uh, it was just, just a few days ago, it was uh, discovered, or at least it was published in the press, that somebody came across of the first folio of Shakespeare, <coughs> which uh, has the handwriting of it, of one John Milton. And he's made notes in, in the margins on, on, on Shakespeare, showing his acquaintance with Shakespeare. And... Uh, which probably would have been guessed just basically upon reading his works. You can note similarities. We, he wrote a, a sonnet on Shakespeare, etc. So it's not that we didn't know that uh, Milton knew Sha of, of Shakespeare in his works, but that he possessed his own copy of it and, and read it extensively and edited it and noted it, that's another thing. So that's interesting for scholars and for uh, the study of literature and the teaching of literature uh, and will probably change the, the study, really, of, of Milton. There'll be a, a movement to talk about how Shakespeare influences Milton now because of that, I suspect. It's a, it's a trail. 
So uh, scholarship does sometimes change its path, and so do, so do literary sensibilities. But the sublime is of, most Im of great importance. So in the classical period, let me get to the, the uh, word here. Uh, the word in Greek here, because this is written in Greek, when it was written, uh, it was thought to be 3rd century AD, but yet still in Greek by a rhetorician by the name of Cassius Longinus. Many scholars now dispute that <laughs> and think that it was probably a few centuries before that, maybe 50 AD or thereabouts, first century at any rate, but it's in Greek. So it's the Ro Roman Empire now has conquered Greece, but the literate men are still engaging in Greek reading the Greeks, writing, and, and re responding to it. So he's probably um, a Roman, highly educated, and he's addressing it to a younger Roman. And uh, there's an intimacy to the tone, uh, teacher to pupil, which uh, marks it out. We'll find the exact same thing when we look at Horace next time. It's also written, uh, it's a master poet writing to a young apprentice, a would-be poet and talking about uh, developing the style for which Horace was famed. How does one become a great poet? The art of poetry is Horace's. But th this is on the sublime and has that, um, that intimacy of a, of a personal note uh, about it. Um, but the idea, let me first start off, up to this point, and it, uh, I, think, I think, and there's a debate about this, but there are three modes of style, and Aristotle mentioned them last time when we looked at rhetoric. There is a low style, a middle style, and a high style. And the low style is appropriate to certain contexts and certain forms of literature, likewise the middle and likewise the high. It's not that any of the three, it's, it's not necessarily inferior and superior, it's fitting. Again, in an egalitarian age like ours, we cannot tolerate rank or distinction without calling it a bias or a prejudice or whatever, uh, and seeking to remove it because there's something uh, anti-democratic or something against human nature. Um, this is a, a, a particular intellectual fetish of our age. Um, historically, there would be a recognition of uh, the importance of a, of a high style and a middle style and a low style and that they had their own dignity. So it's not, even though it's low, it's not that it's not important, it's just fitting to the subject. So these are the high, middle and the low styles. Aristotle mentioned them. We'll find that Horace will also refer to them and they will hold all the way through until the Romantic period and which, at which point they get inverted and the low becomes the high and the high is brought low. So the aristocratic diction, I'm just pointing ahead to Wordsworth's romantic um, revolution, if you will, of poetics. He's going to write in the language of men, the common language of men, of ordinary men. And he's going to avoid the aristocratic type of diction and themes and subject matter. And he's going to speak in the language of men. It's the age of the French Revolution, it's also a poetic. It's, a, it's an embrace of something like the low style in certain respects. And yet there are features about Wordsworth's own writing, which is contemporary Coleridge notes. No rustic ever spoke the way Wordsworth's rustics speak. Nobody, no farmer ever talks the way Wordsworth's common people do. He is pre he's given them the capacity for exalted speech. So he's put the high category in the mouths of the low. That's what Coleridge observes. Whatever we make of that. But, uh, well, but again, I'm getting ahead of myself a bit. And the reason why he does that and he connects to nature is because of a development in the 18th century where the sublime and the natural are united. What is natural is sublime. Uh, but that, that uh, we will come to in a, a few months, but we need to, uh, I, I like pointing ahead where it's going to go and backtracking a little bit here. Uh, in Longinus, he notices that these three types of style 
all exist in both prose and poetry, so it's not merely a matter of poetry. That's to be noted. It was certainly the case that the best writing was thought to reside in poetry, and that's why it was in poetry. It was in, put in verse for the purposes of memory. Nonetheless, even letters, if you did my Bible's Lit course last year, even the uh, letters of the Bible are not letters per se, they're epistles, and the epistle has a, is a literary genre. It has, a particular, it has particular features. It, it has artistry to it. It has certain expectations that go with it. It's not like an email where you say, hey, you, oi, or hey, prof, or whatever I get, because I get strange, not from you anymore, but first year undergrads, I've had some interesting forms of address. But the immediacy of that, you don't see the other person, and it's, it's immediately, there's no salutation, there's no dear, there's no titles, there's none of that, there's no uh, signing off with yours sincerely, yours whatever, that you just you put your name at the end. So it, it drops the formal characteristics of a, of a letter. And that's partly because it's so quick and it has the sense of immediacy, right? Because technology has brought the two together, it has a, a leveling effect. And that's both good and bad. It's good because it's easy. It's bad because it creates all sorts of misunderstandings. It, it, yes? Could that also be from the lack of understanding of, say, authority in our culture? Like they're, they're sort of, the, the technology has that effect as well. It levels, right? It, it, is, okay. it is a powerful tool that uh, enables people, um, even without financial means, to do extraordinary things. But it is an anti-authority aspect as well, but the technology itself tends that way. So does it come from a worldview, an anti-authoritarian worldview? Yes. Is it the effect of technology? Yes. Do the two go together? They do. It levels the differences between people. And uh, again, as I say, there are some good aspects to it and then there are some problematic ones. And one of them is it's really easy to, be, to misunderstand. Uh, when those distinctions are not uh, observed. Uh, but that's, I, getting, I don't want to get off track on that. But that's a tendency that begins in the Enlightenment and really takes off in the Romantic period. And where the poetry is about nature and where the aristocrats are no longer the heroes of poetry. It's the common man. And even more than the common man, it's the child, and even more than the child, it's the orphan, the child without parents, that becomes the hero. So there's a, 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 in looking at nature, a removal of all natural authority within the natural world, and a reduction of human nature to a, uh, an autonomous being with no laws upon him or her uh, besides his own or her own natural impulses. Uh, but that's, again, getting ahead of ourselves here a bit. But this is why the sublime will be important. But I want, in this class, to look at what Longinus says about the sublime, because that in itself is also interesting. So Longinus regards, uh, getting to the subject matter here, as I say, he regards greatness, and hupsos means the elevated, the excellent. So one would have thought, and I tend to think, that he is referring to the third, the highest form of writing. So he's not, like Aristotle speaking of all three, he's going to devote himself explicitly to the highest form of writing. He regards sublimity uh, as a thing of the spirit. This will also appeal to the Romantics. It comes out of the soul of the author. It's a reflection of the internal it's not the language per se, it's the nature of the artist. And this is reflected in his uh, description of uh, means of expressing sublimity. He will enumerate five, I'll get to those in a second. But it's a spark that leaps from the soul of the writer to the soul of the reader. That's what it is. How, does, how are we inspired? So it's about inspiration, which is a, a 
something that interests writers before him. It interests Plato in his Ion. He talks about inspiration and the source of it. The Greek poets all, um, when they're writing poetry, they appeal to the muse as a means of gaining the power needed to tell uh, a, a story or to convey a, a, a form of delight to his audience. They need to go outside themselves. There's a spiritual or even a, a godlike power that is needed. So uh, Longinus is not, he's not inventing this. This is already a matter of interest. But, and you can see from it why this would, would lend itself to uh, somebody who wants to think of things theologically because God is, this, God is spirit and he conveys his truth in spiritual form. So a, a treatise on the sublime that talks about the importance of the spirit of the author affecting the spirit of the audience is obviously going to be conducive to that. And, it, and the other thing I will say is it addresses to some degree the first and the fourth cause. If you want to go back to my quasi-Aristotelian um, description of aspects of a literary theory, this one really is dealing with one and four, the author and the audience. And it's not really so concerned about two and three, the, the literary form, which other theories are obsessed with, but this one is not. It, but he does talk about that. I'll come to that in a second. But it's the expression of the author and it's the uh, impact or the the way it moves the audience, that's of, of great interest to him. And these are interests that the Romantics recover. Romantics are intensely interested in these two things. And so there's a, in the Romantics, a turn to psychology as a great interest, almost a preeminent interest actually, and, uh, and a revival of Shakespeare and his interest in the Romantic period where in the 18th century, uh, it's not that he diminished in his uh, effect, but he really took off when the Romantics observed that Shakespeare was the great, the writer of uh, the human soul and dis you know, expressed people's feelings. So, well, excuse me. Uh, um, so the soul of the poet may be in the entire work or it might just be in a part of it. So Longinus is interesting because he doesn't say when he's talking about the on greatness uh, or perihupsos, when he's speaking of this, he is happy not to speak of the greatness of an, the entirety of a work. It might just be a speech. This speech or this section of a speech is sublime. And he will cite various examples to illustrate that. And it's really interesting the examples that he, he chooses here. So he's not interested in it as a category of literature. So sublime literature isn't, for example, the tragedy or the epic. Whereas Aristotle wanted to say the greatest form of writing is the tragedy. Joseph said, I think it's the epic. And in general, I remember the conversation, and the Greeks would generally have agreed with, with Joseph. Homer, the, gr the great form, greatest form of literature is the epic. Aristotle seems to think that the tragedy is most important because it says something about human nature. That's an interesting observation in and of itself. But he's talking about the whole genre then. And uh, Longinus is not interested in genre. He's, he's finding uh, greatness in all manner of genres, uh, what we would call genres of literature. So he's not interested in the form, as I say, the formal quality or the material qualities of the text. He's simply interested in how the author conveys this spiritual power to his audience. And that can be in brief moments or it can be in more extended. But it, it transcends poetry versus prose, those sort of distinctions. So it, he will talk about, uh, he even quotes scripture, which is really interesting. And this is one of the things that struck Boileau. Uh, he cites uh, John's gospel. When he, uh, where is it? He cites Plato as a source of the sublime. Uh, he cites the poets, Sappho, 
Archilochus Demosthenes. Demosthenes is a rhetorician, so he cites an, an orator, he cites a poet, he cites uh, a philosopher as sources of the sublime, and he also cites, as I say, the Bible. Where is this? I have it here. Oh, never mind, I'll come back to it. But um, God said, let there be light, and there was light. That phrase, he says, is sublime. Cites it as an illustration of the sublime. It says something about God's power. It connects it with light. It's the way the language represents it. It conveys the greatness of the author's mind and the nobility of his character. I'm going to come to the five uh, features of the sublime because he illustrates them. Five sources of sublimity. They're all illustrated on page 138, by the way. Um, those uh, little uh, subtitles there are probably not in the original. But it's a quality of feeling. Now, let me say something about that, because romantic, the romantic appeal to feelings, Wordsworth will connect to nature. You'll say that our, our feelings uh, are at their purest and at their most simple and at their most powerful when they are in, in connection with nature, by which he means the green stuff like the wild, the uncivilized world. It's not to be found in the city. He's going to contrast nature with civilization. And the sublime, this greatness, this, uh, the presence of God is observed most in the presence of the uncivilized places. This is not a scriptural observation, by the way. It's a romantic observation. God is not... Uh, is not uh, more present in the natural world than he is in the human world. God is actually outside space and time. But in the Romantics, they associate the presence of God with the places where human beings are, no, are not present. Or the, or the people de described are somehow outsiders to society. So we'll get uh, orphans, we'll get mad mothers, we'll get war veterans, we'll get thieves, we'll get wanderers. Uh, vagrants, those sorts of people. Natives in this period take on a new significance in the Romantic period because they are thought to be less civilized, closer to nature. This is the depiction, and it's presented in American fiction, uh, Fenimore Cooper's Last of the Mohicans and so forth, which persists to this day. The, the native in those cases is seen as somebody who is superior to the white man because he is closer to nature, more in tune with it, and thereby closer to God. So these are all associations that are that fall post-romantic, which would have baffled anyone before this period, like associating certain categories of people with being closer to God by virtue of the fact that they are allegedly closer to nature. This is strange associations, but they're all romantic associations. So we'll, we'll come to that when we come to it, but uh, let me go back to these five sources of the, of the sublime, and it's interesting. As I say, associated with feeling, but not simply with emotion. So here we need to distinguish Longinus from the romantics. It's not just emotion. Longinus says that it is uh, only with emotion that is noble, or true, these things, these feelings are sublime, not all feeling. Now, Wordsworth actually says something similar, by the way. So it's not the, it's not the mere strength of the feeling. It's the nobility of the feeling and the truth of the feeling, the truth to nature, the truth to the way things really are, the truth to reality. That, that will identify it as, as sublime. And not all emotions can, can be that. Now, the way in which we prevent it from being mere emotional expression is through art. So nature and art work together. 
So I'll come to that right now. So these five marks, the five marks then of the sublime, five sources are enumerated right here. The first and the most important is great thoughts. Great thoughts. This, the author of the sublime will have great thoughts, grand, elevated. The second, strong and inspired emotions. And then he makes this really interesting note, and here it's presented in, in brackets. These two sources, that is the first two, are for the most part natural. The remaining three involve art. That means that the first two and the most important thing for conveying the sublime to the audience are dependent on the artist himself without any culture at all. It's just you have it or you don't. And you can't teach it. And that's really interesting because almost every uh, writer will agree with this. And certainly, we will see next time when we come to Horace, that's what he says. If you're not gifted naturally as a writer, I can't make you a good writer. It's not possible. So you shouldn't try it, <laughs> basically. Um, but you can make somebody a better writer. You just can't be a great writer. To be a great writer, you have to be gifted as such. And that is something that no person has uh, power over. So you are either you're given to great thoughts and you are given to strong and inspired emotions. Noble feeling, I think, is a better translation than the one they've got here. So noble feeling is a good one. And those come to you by nature, your character. You're just born this way. The, the latter three are artistic means. These are things that you can learn. There's a craft, a technique, the words that you choose. So number three, there are certain kinds of figures, figures of thought, figures of speech. I taught those when we did practical criticism, schemes and tropes. Right? This is an art. You can learn schemes. You can learn tropes. You, lear you learn to identify them. You learn to employ them. You learn when to do so. Those will make you a better writer and a better critic. They won't make you a great writer because, again, either you have it or you don't. But you can learn uh, certain kinds of f figures. Lofty figures, in fact, is a good way of describing it. Not, not just any old figures, the ones that are appropriate to rise, uh, uh, raise us up in the poet's hands to uh, an idea greater than we normally have. Uh, the fourth is noble diction, the choice of words, the use of metaphor. So one's a figure of thought or speech, the other is a, uh, the type of diction. The, the words that you choose. Do you avoid vulgarity in your speech? You, if you want sublime, you must avoid vulgarity. You would also avoid slang. Slang cannot be noble. It can't be. It's, it, it's, it's, it's commonplace language, yes, but that's precisely it. So there's a certain type of diction that will avoid vulgarity and slang. So for instance, in your essays, if you haven't heard already, but you probably have, in, in academic writing and certainly in good fiction, if you want to write a certain style of fiction, you avoid vulgarity and slang. If you want to represent the way people really speak, that's fine, but now you have degraded yourself as an author and the audience who's, who's reading and listening. That goes with it. You can speak that way, but it, you can't write that way without having an effect. And then finally, dignified and elevated word arrangement or syntax. So the one is the, a matter of lexis, the other of syntax. The final one. The order of the words is important. And then he will now let us now examine the points which come under each of these heads. So you can see this is a sort of a treatise. He's enumerated the five sources of the sublime, distinguished two of 
the five from the others. These two come by nature and they are the most important. They come as natural gifts and they can't really be taught. They simply are possessed or not. And the other three, the latter three, which can be taught. Now, all three of those will be cultivated in a university, the latter three, or they ought to be. So in practical criticism, we looked at schemes and tropes. We talked about uh, word choice. And we also talked about the importance of syntax. So those three are artistic ween means. So that combined, what we have is the relation of nature to art. Nature is most important. The romantics are going to like that. They will, they will agree. And above all those qualities, when it comes to Boileau's take on this, the sublime of God is above nature even. So true sublimity exceeds nature even. And we'll, we'll look at that more carefully when we come to those texts. But in uh, Longinus's presentation of it, I don't think he, he is addressing what the 18th century and its followers mean by the sublime. He's simply talking about the third, the, the elevated form of speech. So the high, low, middle, and low, he's speaking about the high type of uh, poetry. So let's uh, comments or questions about that before I proceed further. It's clear and straightforward, right? And it also seems a matter of interest and it's easy to follow. Unlike Aristotle's tough stuff, it really is. It's dense and tedious to my <laughs> Works for philosophers, uh, doesn't really work for, for the poet. But he's right on so many things, just not uh, very persuasive. Um, so the first of these five then, and um, we'll look at this, is the greatness of thought. And he says that this is the most important of all. So he is placing thoughts ahead of feelings, the reason ahead of the passions. This would just be following the ancient world in general. This is the most important of all. So he's following Plato's lead to some degree. Ideas are the most important thing of all, great ideas. He says, even if it is a matter of endowment rather than acquisition, we must, so far as it is possible, develop our minds in the direction of greatness and make them always pregnant with noble thoughts. You ask how this can be done? I wrote somewhere, elsewhere, something like this, quote, sublimity is the echo of a noble mind. This is why a mere idea without verbal expression is sometimes admired for its nobility, just as Ajax's silence in the vision of the dead in uh, uh, the Odyssey is grand and indeed more sublime than any words could have been. That's interesting. An absence of speech is, is more eloquent, eloquent and greater than any expression. Great poets do this, by the way. They, at times, they have no words, so they give their characters no words, and that speaks volumes. They're speechless. So then he go, wants to investigate further. So first, then, we must state where, where sublimity comes from. The orator must not have low or ignoble thoughts. So if you want to be a great writer, you must not have low or ignoble thoughts. There's a, almost a, a religious mindset that you must cultivate. And it's not something that you can turn on or turn off. So your character is going to be reflected in your writing. You must not have those thoughts. Whenever you're tended towards that, you must be disciplined about that and banish those thoughts from your heart. Now, later writers will entirely agree with this. Wordsworth agrees with this. Milton agrees with it. Shakespeare would agree with it. Must not do those things because you debase yourself and you, you diminish your ability as a writer when you do that. But he says, you must not uh, have lower ignoble thoughts. Those whose thoughts and habits are trivial and servile all their lives cannot possibly produce anything admirable or worthy of eternity. Words will be great if thoughts are weighty. 
This is the apologetic for the liberal arts and the great books. Fill your minds with great thoughts and great words. It's giving you a, a diet which you will hopefully, or at least the intention is, that you will not want to do without. And you will fill your own thoughts and ideas and hearts and expressions with those same. And then you will convey those to others. So it has a liberalizing effect on society, a humanizing effect. It humanizes you and it humanizes those around you. So it has that effect. So that, hence the importance of the books that we read, not just any old books, not ones that you like or that you naturally gravitate toward, but those which are renowned for greatness. Greatness of thought. So the, th the words will be great if the thoughts are weighty. So let's occupy ourselves with great thoughts. And then he, he goes on a little bit of a distraction here, or actually there, it, it's more the fact that the editor has cut out some elements here and then talked about other things, and I'm going to skip over that. But I do want to uh, draw your attention to 13, section 2, where he speaks about Plato. And he's reiterating what I've just said. Plato, if we, will, if we will read him with attention, illustrates yet another road to sublimity besides those we have discussed. This is the way of imitation and emulation of great writers of the past. Here too, my friend, is an aim to which we must hold fast. Many are possessed by a spirit, not their own. Okay, so we may not have great thoughts by nature, but when we are exposed to great thoughts in the mind of a great writer, may we not possess the mind of the author and, and hunger for those same capacities. And this is why it, uh, scriptures also in, in churches is recommended. The mind of Christ will be in you if you read the counsel of God, and that will change your life. It will transform, it will give you a, a breadth and a depth and a, a width in your vision that will exalt you and those around you. And you need that mind of Christ. But the, the great book, similarly, he, he's going to speak of this. So here too, my friend, is a name to which we must hold fast. Many are possessed by a spirit, not their own. It is like what we are told of the Pythia at Delphi. She is in contact with the tripod near the cleft in the ground, which, so they say, exhales a divine vapor. And she is thereupon made pregnant by the supernatural power and forthwith prophecies as one inspired. Similarly, the genius of the ancients acts as a kind of oracular cavern and effluences flow from it into the minds of their imitators. Even those previously not much inclined to prophecy become inspired and share the enthusiasm which comes from the greatness of others. Was Herodotus, the historian, the only most Homeric writer? Surely, and then he names two others, which we won't have heard of, Stesi, Chorus, and Archilochus earned the name before him. So, more than any, did Plato, who diverted to himself countless rills from the Homeric spring. So Plato, although he attacks Homer, has clearly been the, almost the most greatly influenced by Homer. He's drunk deeply from the Mount of Parnassus, of the poets. It's, it's made him the man he is. And you can tell it because he's citing it by memory. He's read this. He, he's not just read it, he has memorized it inwardly. It's become part of his character. And he says, furthermore, he said, Plato could not have put such a brilliant finish on his philosophical doctrines or so often risen to poetical subjects and poetical language if he had not tried and tried wholeheartedly to compete for the prize against Homer, like a young aspirant challenging an admired master. To break a lance in this way may well have been a brash and contentious thing to do, but the competition proved anything but valueless. So he could never have been, become Homer, but the attempt to be so w did not go without its mark, and it led to his own greatness. Similarly, the, the, the poet Hesiod said, this strife is good for men. So to contend with great authors and to seek to, to be superior to them, you will not be able to do it, but you should seek to do so. And who knows, maybe you will be. Mr. Milton 
claimed he was by the Spirit of God. Others can judge that for themselves. But the aim to do so, that's part of good study. It's part of good writing. So truly it is a noble contest and prize of honor and one well worth winning in which to be defeated by one's elders is itself no disgrace. So if you contend with Homer and Homer is better than you, you're not disgraced. How, who could have expected otherwise? So this is fascinating. We can apply this to ourselves. When we are working on something which needs loftiness of expression and greatness of thought, it is good to imagine how Homer would have said the same thing. I will add, or Jesus. Or one of the heroes of scripture. How would they have dealt with this situation? Let's look at that from that vantage point. Let's not think how I'm responding to it. I'm responding immediately. I'm upset. I'm angry. I'm whatever. I'm provoked. And I want to blurt out something. Let me think of how Jesus would deal with this. Let me pull back and imagine I'm a greater man than I am. And then maybe I will be a greater man than I am. So he said, let's imagine how Homer would have said the same thing, or how Plato or Demosthenes or in history, Thucydides, the historian, would have invested it with sublimity. These great figures, now he's talking just about their, their articulation of ideas. How would Demosthenes have put it, the great orator? What's his stylistic uh, features? What are the features of Demoth Demosthenes' oratory? When I studied Greek in Germany, uh, one of the things that we did, and I, I dropped it th thereafter, is we took, uh, we translated book 24, the Iliad. And that was, and that was enough for me. It's like, because Homeric Greek is even different than classical Greek. So you start doing that. And then when they, if you went on in this, you had to do stylistic exercises. Now, what were the stylistic exercises? You had to write in the style and with the vocabulary of the authors that you were seeking to emulate. So how would Homer have put this in Homeric Greek? And how would Demosthenes have read it, written this in his Greek? And how would Plato have done it? So you're trying to imitate their style. Now that will mark you out as having mastery of the language. So it's not the other way around. Let's take that and translate it into my language. Just do it the other way. I think, all right, I'm... I cry uncle. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not achieving this greatness. I'm in my mid-20s now. This is, this is too long and too hard, and I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it. But the point is the same. This is the spirit of true scholarship. We are seeking to imitate the thoughts and also the language, because the languages are the, are the clothes for the thoughts. And that's why people historically memorized great sections of poetry and scripture. And I'm to this day amazed that nobody does that anymore. And it's partly because of the internet technology. It's the leveler. You don't have to have an education. You can just do research, which means that you do a Google search. That's research. <laughs> Type in a phrase. Well, what if you're res you can't spell? Then you can't do research very well either. You get a problem on Google search. But it's word check. Yeah, word check, yeah. <laughs> But the word check doesn't always give you the word. If you know a word that the word checker doesn't know, then it checks and changes the word that you typed in there. It drives me insane. As I say, the great leveler. And worse, it makes the people that do the Google searches think that they know better than the person who they're answering to. You think, I know what I'm talking about. And you have no idea you've done a Google search and you think that you're, you're, you're contradicting me. Well, you are contradicting me, but not out of knowledge. The problem is you can't, that's not a persuasive argument necessarily unless somebody has a knowledge base to say, well, that's not right. It's just, but it says here in the search that this is it. And I said, but, but how do you know that the person who wrote that knew what they were talking about? Anyway. But this is, this is great stuff. He says they, he says they will uh, these great figures presented to us as objects of emulation and as it were shining before our gaze will somehow elevate our minds to the greatness of which we form a mental image. They will be even more effective if we ask ourselves, how would Homer or Demosthenes have reacted to what I am saying if he had been here? 
not just what would he have done, how would he respond to my articulation of this? The way I, when I form this, what would Homer, would Homer have said? Put his head in his hand, oh my goodness. Like what on earth? This is embarrassing. Or Demosthenes, imagine him in my audience. Not just what would Jesus do. If Jesus were in front of me, what would he think? There's a humbling thought. It makes a great occasion if you imagine such a jury or audience for your own speech and pretend that you are answering for what you write before judges and witnesses of such heroic stature. Even more stimulating is the further thought. How will posterity take what I am writing? Never mind what my contemporaries are, think. How will future generations regard this? If a man is afraid of saying anything which will outlast his own life and age, the conceptions of his mind are bound to be incomplete and abortive. They will miscarry and never be brought to birth, whole and perfect for the day of posthumous fame. Now, with that in mind, you want to be correct. You want to speak truth. You want to deal with the good, the true, and the beautiful, that, because those will transcend the ages in which you are. Now, if that mindset still preoccupied the academy, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in right now as opposed to publish or perish, in which we are publishing and perishing. It was the dichotomy, this or that? Well, it's both. You got publishing and perishing. I liked that. <laughs> and I'm not sure it'll last the ages, but that was, yeah, good thought. I, I just did. I'll put it on the internet. That's a publication now, right? There you go. Copyright. Copyright. Um, so then he will go on to, um, yeah, he's, he's, are, he's expressing these things, but I don't think he always does, uh, or at least the edition we have has, has cut out some of the noble feeling, but I think the noble feeling and the, noble and the uh, great thoughts are in many ways l linked. But the feelings are the, the, the right sentiments, if you will. So uh, re reacting with the right and feeling the right things in the right context, which Plato says is, is true education. So if you go to C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man, he talks about the aims of education being to make pupils feel disgust at disgusting things and to be, uh, r respond to injustice with outrage and to want to take the hill occupied by the enemy when reading of the great deeds of hither here. And so they're, they're characters being formed. So it's the right character and you can form that. He says you can't. I think uh, I know what he means, but I think it character can be taught. Education has always uh, suggested that the, the heart can be formed, the character with it. Or at least it can be improved. Some simply have a greatness of spirit which uh, is irrepressible. And usually they've had to endure uh, suffering in order to get to that point. If you read biographies, that is often the case. Uh, but those are the things that were uh, of nature, and those are the most important ones, he says. So the great thoughts, the most important. The second, the noble feelings that accompany it. Both of them, uh, I think, an essential part of a liberal arts education. The Tyndale motto is, our aim is to what? Gosh, I can't even remember. Proclaim the truth, educating and, I've forgotten it. I wrote the darn thing. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> it was on a committee. I forgot the silly thing. Pursue the truth, and it's talking about mind, heart, and character, that sort of thing. Uh, for the greater glory of God. Oh, that was edited out. Um, but uh, these are gifts of nature, not art. What is of art are what he then describes here. And he, he talks about uh, visualization. And this is really interesting when it comes to the 18th century and the 19th century on page 143 in your if you've got this one here, section 15.1, visualization, fantasy, fantasia. He doesn't mean uh, the sense of imagining something that's not there. He means of an image that arises in the mind 
that sense of fantasy or visualization. And he says that this leads to elevated thoughts as well. So I'll just read it. Another thing which is extremely productive of grandeur, magnificence, and urgency, my young friend, is visualization, fantasia. I use this word for what some people call image production. In the Romantics, it's imagination. The term fantasia is used generally for anything which in any way suggests a thought productive of speech. But the word has also come into fashion for the situation in which enthusiasm, and here he means that technically the translation enthusiasm is in theos, so the gods have inspired that sort of sense, inspiration, enthusiasm. He's enthused. In which enthusiasm and emotion make the speaker see what he is saying and bring it visually before his audience. So the thought is so clear that it is clothed in an image and the image is presented to the audience in a way that the audience can recognize a, the great power of the imagination which Shakespeare possessed and so did Milton. A, almost a visual image of, and, and the words used it to, to present his thoughts in a way that moved his audience to, I, I see what you're saying. And you, we use that phrase, I see. It's, it's actually, you would think it's wrong, I'm talking, you don't see anything, but yeah, I do, because you've given an image and now I've got it, yes. And the reason why visual images, by the way, are not helpful in this context is because you need to provoke in the audience, work on their spiritual part to create that image in themselves and then it sticks with them. There's no point in just putting it up on a screen. That, you just receive it and then it fades out of your mind and it's gone. But if you are brought to visualize that in your own mind, it sticks with you and perdures beyond the lecture. That's, that's the intent at any rate. So he brings it visually before his audience. It will not escape you that rhetorical visualization has a different intention from that of the poets. In poetry, the aim is astonishment. In oratory, it is clarity. Both, however, seek emotion and excitement. And now he quotes Euripides, Orestes. Mother, I beg you, do not drive them at me. The woman with the blood in their eyes and the snakes they are here, they are here, jumping right up to me. The Furies coming at him. Or again, oh, oh, she'll kill me. Where shall I escape? The poet himself was the Irenaeus, the Furies, and has as good, has as good as made his audience see what he imagined. He imagined. Shakespeare's this is with uh, Macbeth. Is this a dagger I see before my eye? It sits there. He's got no. He shouldn't have a dagger in his hand. It's, I've seen productions where they stick a dagger in his hand. It's terrible if they do that. Like, is this a dagger I see before my eyes? No, it's not. You're imagining it. Yes, but he, he sees it, and, and there's blood's on his hand. Lady Macbeth, she can't get the blood out, but she, she thinks there's still blood on it. Why? Is she, it's it's powerful stuff. She can't get the blood off her hands. She's washing and washing frantically. Well, it's, it, the blood reflects her sense of guilt, it's, right? And she can't wash that away. Her, sense of, her conscience has been pricked. And she can't wash it out. She can't get rid of it. What a powerful image. But it's a mental image. You can imagine if you've ever felt guilt, which hopefully you have. So you get, you're a psychopath, and that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. <laughs> you heard it here first. That's not a good thing. Um, but he, he says the poetical examples, and if you are, um, well, I, never mind. As I said, have a quality of exaggeration which belongs to fable and goes far beyond credibility. In an orator's visualizations, on the other hand, it is the element of fact and truth which makes for success. Because an orator, remember, is encouraging people to, to act. That's the purpose of oratory. People are not going to act and risk their lives, risk their wealth, risk, risk their time, unless they're persuaded that something's true. The poet doesn't need to do that. 
He wants to ad, ad, you, lead you to astonishment, not to action. The orator wants you to act, therefore he has to lead you to the truth. It lets you see things clearly. If we don't act now, like think Winston Churchill, the West will fall. We'll fight them on the beaches, right? And we will stand. This, these sorts of, right? So they, they visualize in their minds what's going on. Remember, the soldiers are listening to him while he speaks. This is what we will do. And in the end game, and they, they visualize and they imagine. I can imagine when they went to the battlefields, they'd have his speeches ringing in their ears. Because otherwise, all they're seeing is a terrible, like if you ever see the D-Day landings. Oh, how on earth did those men ever do such things? You know, dying like flies on the beaches. Um, but this effect, so rhetorical visualization, and he asks about this then, what is the effect of rhetorical visualization? There is much it can do to bring urgency and passion into our words, but it is when it is closely involved with factual arguments that it enslaves the bearer as well as persuading him. Note that he is agreeing with Aristotle and he's not with Plato. He doesn't, he's not dismissing rhetoric. He has been affected by Aristotle. He agrees with Aristotle that rhetoric, rightly used, is employing the truth and its aim is the truth. Why would he come to this conclusion? Because he is possessed of noble thoughts himself. Right? That's why. This is actually, this is why we listen to Longinus. When we, when we read him, we think, this man had a great mind and a great heart. Otherwise, he could not have written such a thing. So suppose you heard a shout this very moment outside the court, and someone said that the prison had been broken open and the prisoners had escaped. No one, young or old, would be so casual as not to give what help he could. And if someone then came forward and said, this is the man who let them out, our friend would never get a hearing. It would be the end of him. There's a similar instance in Hyperides' defense of himself when he was on trial for the proposal to liberate the slaves, which he put forward after the defeat. It was not the proposer, he said, who drew up this decree. It was the Battle of Sharonia. Here the orator uses a visualization actually in the moment of making his factual argument with the result that his thought has taken him beyond the limits of mere persuasiveness. Because he connects it with a battle of Shrona that's just happened and people visualize that event themselves and that is persuasive in itself. So it's, a, it's an illustration. Illustrations are essential to good teaching. A fact, a reason, an illustration, an example. The example is the... Uh, ornamentation for the logic just provided. So he talks about this. Then he moves on, finally, to uh, figures. This is the point, point three. And these are things that can be taught by art. So figures. So again, the first two were of nature, mind, and uh, noble feelings. And the final three are of art. And the art is there to enhance the nature. But the, these can be taught. These are a way. Art always means a way, by the way. It's a way of doing it. So there's a technique. So that, that is that of figures. Properly handled, figures constitute, as I said, no small part of sublimity. It would be a vast, or rather infinite, labor to enumerate them all. What I shall do is to expound a few of these which generate sublimity simply in order to confirm my point. Now here's the illustration. Demosthenes, the greatest orator of the Greek world. Of the uh, Roman world, it would be Cicero. But Demosthenes, the greatest of all, cited by Cicero. Demosthenes. Here's Demosthenes putting forward a demonstrative argument on behalf of his policy. What would have been the natural way to put it? Quote, you've done nothing wrong. You've done none wrong, rather. You have not done wrong. Third time, you have not done wrong, you who fought for the liberty of Greece. You have examples to prove this close at home. The men of Marathon, of Salamis, of Plataea, 
did not, did not do wrong. End quote. He could have said this. That's not what he said. But instead of this, he was suddenly inspired to give voice to the oath by the heroes of Greece. By those who risk their lives at Marathon, you have not done wrong. Observe what he affects by this single figure of conjuration, or apostrophe as I call it here. He deifies his audience's ancestors, suggesting that it is right. Go away. Pardon me. Oops. Yep. He deifies his audience's ancestors, suggesting that it is right to take an oath by men who fell so bravely as though they were gods. He inspires the judges with the temper of those who risked their lives. He transforms his demonstrations into an extraordinary piece of sublimity and passion and into the convincingness of this unusual and amazing oath. At the same time, he injects into his hearers' minds a healing, specific, so as to lighten their hearts by these paeons of praise and make them as proud of the battle with Philip as of the triumphs of Marathon and Salamis. In short, the figure enables him to run away with his audience. By those who risk their lives in Marathon, you have not done wrong. Apostrophe, he, he speaks to the audience that's not there. Then he talks about the relation between figures and, and sublimity. Uh, I'm just going through them here. Um, and he lists a variety. I'll, I'll go over a couple of them. Do you have any preferences here? But between figures and sublimity in general, I am going to talk. But then he goes on to her hyperbaton, um, and then he moves on uh, to to diction, which is the uh, fourth of the sections. But why don't I talk about this? I've got 15 minutes, I think, or thereabouts. At this point, my friend, I feel I ought not to pass over an observation of my own. It shall be very brief. Figures are natural allies of sublimity and themselves profit wonderfully from the alliance. I will explain how this happens. Playing tricks by means of figures is a peculiarly suspect procedure. It raises the suspicion of a trap, a deep design, a fallacy. It is to be avoided in addressing a judge who has power to decide and especially in addressing tyrants, kings, governors, or anybody in a high place. Don't use figures. Speak plainly. Don't use figures in that. You will raise suspicions. Such a person immediately becomes angry if he's led astray like a foolish child by some skillful orator's figures. He takes the fallacy as indicating contempt for himself. He becomes like a wild animal. Even if he controls his temper, he is now completely conditioned against being convinced by what is said. A figure is therefore generally thought to be best when the fact that it is a figure is concealed. So don't be too conspicuous in your use of figures. So there's an art to figures. The art has to be hidden. It has to appear natural, truthful, unpremeditated. So even if you have a speech rehearsed, don't let them know that you've rehearsed the speech. It comes out naturally. This is your response. In the ancient world, by the way, orators were uh, not only speaking themselves, but they created speeches for others to use in courts and, and elsewhere, speech writers. And then the, the, uh, they would be memorized by whoever the speaker was and practiced. And here's how you rehearse it, just like our politicians are going to do in their debates not long from now. Somebody will have written a speech for them. It'll be at the beginning of their time or at the end of it. They'll suddenly sound eloquent rather than the doofuses that they sound like in between when they're talking to one another. There'll be this one minute and rousing oratory. Well, that's somebody else's words there, isn't it? My fellow Canadians. Anyway. But Thus, sublimity and emotion are a defense and a marvelous aid against the suspicion which the use of figures engenders. So there is a place for emotion. And the place is that it conceals artifice because emotions arise naturally from our passions. So if you want to appear like you're, it's unpremeditated, 
get upset, angry, because it doesn't appear like there has been reflection that's gone into the, it's just a spontaneous response. These are a marvelous aid against the suspicion which the use of figures engenders. The artifice of the trick is lost to sight in the surrounding brilliance of beauty and grandeur, and it escapes all suspicion. And now he quotes and gives an example. By the men of Marathon is proof enough. For how did Demosthenes conceal the figure in that passage? By sheer brilliance, of course. As fainter lights disappear when the sunshine surrounds them, so the sophisms of rhetoric are dimmed when they are enveloped in encircling grandeur. So he's not saying that De Demosthenes isn't using rhetoric. He's saying that his, his use of rhetoric is so powerful that it doesn't appear rhetoric anymore. It just appears an expression of his natural amplitude of mind, his greatness. Something like this happens in painting. Now this is an illustration. When light and shadow are juxtaposed in colors on the, on the same plane, the light seems more prominent to the eye, and both stands out and actually appears much nearer. You have both of them. Similarly in literature, emotional and sublime features seem closer to the mind's eye, both because of a certain natural kinship and because of their brilliance. Consequently, they always show up above the figures and overshadow and eclipse the artifice. So now that's really interesting. So when you're reading scripture, for example, well, this just died. No, it didn't. Still going on. Think in scripture when there are passages which just leap out and you remember them. Just they, those, those are the sublime passages that, that seem nearer to you. It's all inspired word. The, the Bible is the word of God. It's all in, the inspired word. But certain passages seem to move you and they are closer to you. They Literally, they seem like they're right in your heart. They speak to you. They move you. He is speaking about the use of the sublime there in passages that we would associate, in, in the case of the Bible, then with the word of God. This is the word of God. Yet some passages seem to be more godly than others, which is almost blasphemous to say, but that he's talking about the effect of language there. And I think it's, I, when I taught Bible as literature, I was addressing those sorts of features, because you can talk about the language and the effect of language. Now, he goes on to a few different ones. Um, I'll, I'll skip over the comments or questions on that before I speak a little bit about um, I want to go to genius versus mediocrities in, on page 149. Because this is another great category of the 18th century. Page 149 on sublimity. He, he makes a digression. The digression is the editor puts digression in there. It's not, I don't, it's not Longinus. The, the editor is saying he goes off topic here and talks about genius versus mediocrity. It's, it's necessarily the editor's in, in position because genius is an 18th century category. What is a genius? A genius is somebody who is a, a genius, a naturally gifted individual far exceeding his contemporaries. Mozart's a genius. A prodigy, a child prodigy, that's a genius, right? In this age, that's not what a genius is. Everybody has a genius. A tutelary spirit. Socrates had a genius. It was a spirit that spoke to him at times. He, he speaks of this. And places had genii. genii. But here he's speaking as uh, those who have a greatness uh, of capacity as opposed to those who, who lack it. And so it's a digression. Well, it's a digression because it's not really, um, doesn't really fit with what he's saying. So let's just look at this very briefly. By the way, in the 18th century, geniuses are always natural and closely associated with nature. And I'll say more about that in a month and a half or so. But he says that faults of this kind form the subject of Achilles' attack in this book on Lysias da, 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 when he declared Lysias in all respects superior to Plato. He has, in fact, given way without discrimination to two emotions, loving Lysias more deeply than he loves himself, he yet 
hates Plato with an even greater intensity. His motive, however, is desire to score a point. And his assumptions are not, as he believed, generally accepted. In preferring Lysias to Plato, he thinks he is preferring a faultless and pure writer to one who makes many mistakes, but the facts are far from supporting his view. Let us generally consider a really pure and correct writer. We have then to ask ourselves, in general terms, whether grandeur attended by some faults of execution is to be preferred, in prose or poetry, to a modest success of impeccable soundness. Now, this is a great subject discussion matter. Um, is it preferable to have greatness mixed with a lot of mediocrity or even base qualities, or is it better to have flawless mediocrity? Which is better? Greatness mixed with low passages and passages which, oh, how on earth did the man who wrote this also write that? Or is it better to be mediocre but consistent and good? That's the question. He says, we must also ask whether the greater number of good qualities or the greater good qualities ought properly to win the literary prizes. These questions are relevant to a discussion of sublimity and urgently require an answer. I am certain in the first place that great geniuses are least pure. They're not always great, but there are passages that are purple, purple prose is his phrase. Actually, it's not his phrase, it's Horace's. Exactness in every detail involves a risk of meanness. With grandeur, as with great wealth, there ought to be something overlooked. It may also be inevitable that lower mediocre abilities should maintain themselves generally at a correct and safe level, simply because they take no risks and do not aim at the brights or the heights, whereas greatness, just because it is greatness, incurs danger risks saying something foolish and occasionally does as a consequence. So think of it in the sporting realm. Like some, the great hockey players, they try a trick that they can't pull off and every once in a while they pull it off and everyone goes out to watch that. That's why you're there. You go, the, everyone goes to see that. That's, and they don't pull it off nine times out of 10, the coach benches them now because we can't have that, because he failed nine times out of 10. Whereas the mediocre player, he succeeded five times out of 10, but he could never do that one thing, which is why people come to watch it, but never mind. But the same thing, greatness in favor of efficiency and mediocrity, but consistency, that is considered to be a good team and it's a winning thing, but that's not artistic greatness. And it's not greatness on, in any field, actually. But there's a, he, so he's pointing out it's better to have uh, greatness and some failures rather than consistency and no failures. This is why I encourage you in your essays to push out the boat a little bit and try going beyond your capacities because you don't know what they are until you try either. Some people come here writing A essays in first year. By the time they've got to fourth year, they're writing Cs. And the essays are just as good in first year as they were in fourth year, but that's the point. They should be getting better. They're going to get better when they push themselves. It's not capacity. It's a failure to take risks. So anyway, so he's convinced that I think he's right. And I've heard this from other um, people in uh, life, uh, coaches, teachers. They don't want to coach or teach out of the pupil their willingness to take a risk. It makes them soulless. Don't, don't kill that. So if the kid loves to do something, let, let them do it. Let, let, them, let them fail. As long as they have the spirit to keep on trying, this is, this is a good thing. So he's talking about this, and I'm aware of a second point. All human affairs are, in the nature of things, better known on their worst side. The memory of mistakes is ineffaceable. That of goodness is soon gone. I have myself cited not a few mistakes in Homer and other great writers, not because I take pleasure in their slips, but because I consider them not so much voluntary mistakes as oversights let fall at random through inattention and with the negligence of genius. I do, however, think that the greater good qualities, even if not consistently maintained, are always more likely to win the prize if for no other reason, because of the greatness of spirit they reveal. 
Ap Apollonius makes no mistakes in the Argonautica. Theocritus is very felicitous in his the pastorals, apart from a few passages not collect, connected with the theme. But would you rather be Homer or Apollonius? So these men never make a mistake. They're consistent in their style. Who are we going to read? We're going to read Homer, even if they're infelicities of phrasing and so forth. So I, I take this as not only a, an expression of the sublime, I think it's, it's, it's life teaching. Aim for greatness, and you never know. You might achieve it. If you aim for a grade, you may not get the grade, and you certainly won't ever rise above your station. Anyway, so we can conclude with that. Thoughts or comments, but I realize I've come to the end. But this is a treatise on, on the sublime. I think it's more than that. It's talking about character. Uh, but vastly influential, not in its time, but in the 17th and 18th centuries, and we'll see that when we come to it. No questions? Okay. So next class, we'll do Horace uh, on poetry. <laughs>